yeah, he can, he'll know to come up. You'll have to pardon me for a minute, um, if you don't mind. <clears throat> I hope I, I hope I don't give you indigestion, but um, Chris, it's nice to see you here. <laughs> I was asked to say a few words just as an introduction to this evening's activities, uh, other than the eating. And um, I want to say that it's just a, a wonderful opportunity for me, um, and I think for everybody who's here uh, to come and um, honor Chris, and to honor Rhoda as well. And we'll hear about both of them uh, in a little while. Um, Chris has had a, a leading role here uh, in, in Vancouver in education uh, with particular interest in the um, history of the Jewish people in, in Europe over the last four or five hundred years. And a special focus in our way of, uh, in our experience here at Temple Shalom with his, with his work, his intense work and sensitive work in the Holocaust, which is a phenomenon which unfortunately we're all too aware of again now, but um, the seeds of, with, of which were uh, sown over a century ago. Um, it's been uh, our privilege to have him here, and uh, one of the specific things that we're honoring tonight is his 20-year tenure as our uh, Devar Torah uh, speaker on Yom Kippur afternoon. And uh, although he said that he's not going to do the formal lecture again, I think he's going to continue to do a few things. And I think we, we have not heard the last from you. That's my guess. Um, He's also been very active in the community here, as most of you know, not just here at Temple Shalom, but he's been a great asset uh, through the Holocaust Society, taking a strong role in Kristallnacht uh, observance. And um, listen, he's been a professor at UBC. Nothing to sneeze at, probably. Um, I see Richard Mengis is back there too. We won't say anything else about that, but I just want to say, Chris, that I also have a personal thank you on behalf of my family, because I think we're probably some of your oldest students. My son-in-law said he came to your classes in the 70s, Amy and Nomi in the 80s, and I've been hanging around you for a long time as well. I remember when you gave, started, you and Rhoda both gave talks at our old temple on 10th Avenue with, back in the early 80s. So it's been a long time since we've known you. So I want to thank you personally for, for my family and the rest of the group. Um, now John Silver is going to tell you a little bit more detail and introduce the speakers uh, from the family and other people who are going to say a few words about it. So John. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, good evening, everyone. Shabbat Shalom. It is indeed a special occasion, and it turns out to be a special occasion in more than one way for the Friedrichs family. We have the pleasure of having uh, uh, Ellen, Jonathan, and Jeremy, Chris's children, with us. But I found out this evening that this is actually the only way they managed to get together in one room at the same time, flying 3,000 miles to Vancouver from New York. They all live in New York, but it turns out their lives don't bring them together. So all three of you, it's a great pleasure to have you with us, and we're looking forward to your remarks. Our first speaker is going to be Richard Menkes, a close friend of Chris, a colleague, and like him, a distinguished professor of history. And it is thanks to Richard that we actually have this event. Richard, although he's not a member of this synagogue, was very aware of the lectures that Chris has given on Yom Kippur afternoon of 20 years. 
and he was the instigator of suggesting that there should be a book published as well as having an event that celebrates this evening. He approached our Clay Kodesh and the rest of history we have this evening. So Richard, it's a great pleasure to have you with us and invite you to say some remarks. I'm not sure I have much to say anymore. Um, while I appreciate the invitation to help honor my friend Chris, my role in this has been minimal and quite frankly, comes from a healthy dose of self-interest. For years, Kathy and I have gathered to break Yom Kippur with cherished friends who are members of our Chavura and members of Temple Sholem. I'm leaving a pause because usually there's a Chavura cheer, but I guess it's not coming. Invariably, one topic of discussion was the moving Holocaust-related talk delivered by my dear friend and colleague, Chris. I always felt like I had missed something important on those, on those Yom Kippers, and I knew that on, I was only indirectly hearing his thoughts and that, they would, that this indirect hearing could not do justice to the original words. That's why shortly before Yom Kippur in 2017, I wrote to the temple's rabbis suggesting the publication of Chris's addresses. Now I know that it's hardly the right time to get in touch with rabbis in the, at Yom Kippur, and I wasn't really expecting a quick answer, but they answered in what seemed like a millisecond, and they agreed, they agreed enthusiastically. And soon after that, we approached Chris with the idea and I was thrilled that he was open to it. As a historian and a member of the Jewish community of Vancouver, I am pleased to see the appearance of this collection. It is, I believe, an important document for understanding the cultural life of the Vancouver Jewish community. In Chris, we have a public-minded intellectual with a deep personal and professional connection to the Holocaust who is confronting its meaning for his community. But all readers of this volume, in Vancouver and elsewhere, are certain to be inspired by this book because of Chris's thoughtful and sensitive approach to the issues of Jewish memory and Jewish ethical responsibilities. <laughs> We're not sure who was next. Um, so it's my pleasure now to introduce um, Chris's children who are gonna say a few words. Uh, Jeremy, Jonathan, and Ellen, please, if you'll join us up here. All right, we made an executive decision that we will go in order of age. So as the eldest, I will go first. So I'm Ellen. In the summer of 2017, I was visiting Vancouver from where I live in New York. My father and I were talking and lamenting the early days of the Trump administration. Like many of us who live in the States, I muttered something about the situation making me want to move back home to Canada. My dad got serious for a second. You don't have to move back yet, he said. You don't even have to move back if he gets a second term. But if he steals a third, that's when you leave. <laughs> that's when it becomes dangerous. This, he explained, was one of the many lessons of the Holocaust, and I should keep it in mind. That he made this link was not surprising. Certainly, my father has done so much Holocaust education in the larger community, but this was also something that happened at home. So it was natural for me to turn to him when I was 18 and spending a year in Israel with Habonim Dror and needed help with a project. The program offered us something called Chofesh Mudrach, a week away from Kibbutz Jenny Mangle. You might remember this, we were there together. Um, where we could study a topic that was interested to us. 
And I decided I wanted to learn more about my family's experience in Germany. And so I asked my dad if he would help. He said yes. So exactly 30 years ago, we met in Berlin. I think it was April, or March or April. Um, and there we traced my maternal great-grandparents' last years. This started with a visit to their original well-appointed apartment, and it ended in front of the rundown building where my great-grandmother was sent before being transported to Auschwitz. Then my dad put me on a train to Warsaw, and I went to see for myself the place where she had perished. So when a few years later, I found myself running the Jewish Student Association for my school's middle schoolers, I realized that in one of the rare positives to come out of the pandemic, I could get my dad to guest lecture via Zoom for Yom HaShoah. The group was going to hear from a survivor later in the month, but I knew my dad would be able to provide the context to this group of kids who ranged from regular Hebrew school attendees to those who had never before done anything formerly Jewish before joining our club. Not surprisingly, he nailed it and managed to keep a room full of 11 and 12 year olds totally engaged despite the barriers of a screen and the distance for them from the events he was discussing. Then last summer, I decided I wanted to look into a new project. A bit of irony for many of us is that the German government offers the descendants of Jews who have been stripped of their citizenship under Nazi rule the chance to be repatriated. I thought I might be eligible via my mother's side of the family, but I needed my dad's help to figure that out. So last August, we spent days going through my late mother's boxes. We sifted through handwritten birth certificates from the 1800s. They were all labeled with Moses, Moses, Jewish. We found 100-year-old passports. We found the letter informing my grandfather that he could no longer practice medicine as a Jewish doctor under the Nuremberg Laws, and much, much more. I knew other people who had done this, relatives who are here in this room. Many had hired professionals to help them navigate German municipal record halls or to translate ancient documents, but I didn't need to do that because I had my dad. Embarking on this project with him, one that I should mention he will not benefit from, he is not eligible, unlike us, for German citizenship, <laughs> was a reminder of the role the Holocaust has always played in my family. It was also a reminder that my father is so unfailingly generous with his time and with his knowledge and expertise. I think I take that for granted. I, I know I take that for granted. But seeing everybody here tonight, I'm overwhelmed to realize how true that is for him on a much larger scale. So thank you. Hi, I'm Jonathan. Dad published his first book 45 years ago in 1979. It was titled Urban Society in an Age of War, Nerdlingen, 1580 to 1720. It's a study of a small walled city in Germany where Dad spent a lot of time in the early 70s doing meticulous research in the archives. The book's dedication reads, to my father, Kurt Otto Friedrichs, my first and best teacher. Kurt, my grandfather, was born in Germany in 1901. He was a brilliant mathematician with expertise in aerodynamics, shock waves, quantum field theory, and a host of other advanced subjects most of us couldn't begin to fathom. He had an extremely prestigious career as a professor and was undoubtedly heading towards a brilliant academic greatness in Germany. However, on February 4th, 1933, just four days after Hitler came to power, he met and fell in love with a Jewish woman. And after the Nuremberg Laws were passed in 1935, their relationship was officially doomed. He had to choose between a career in his homeland under a regime he despised or marry the woman he loved. He made the monumental decision to have not only his career, to leave not only his career behind, but also his entire family as well. 
In fact, after emigrating to the US illegally, he never saw his parents again. After arriving in New York, Kurt reestablished himself at NYU at the Courant Institute of Mathematical Science, which is one of the leading centers of mathematics in the United States. Here he had a flourishing career. He published many books and was eventually awarded the National Medal of Science handed to him directly by President Jimmy Carter. Equally important, he raised a large family and enjoyed a long and happy 45-year marriage. I know that my grandfather's life and his life's work made an enormous impact on my father. And in some ways, there are many parallels. My father also had a long, successful marriage, lasting 44 very happy years. And my father also had a thriving academic career as a professor at UBC, giving lectures to tens of thousands of students over the decades, and publishing several books on urban society in Europe in the early modern era. His other area of expertise is German Jewish history and the Shoah. This was no doubt inspired by his family roots. Dad was, and still is, one of the foremost leaders of Holocaust education in Vancouver. He has worked closely with the Vancouver Holocaust Education Center, has led Holocaust high school symposiums, Kristallnacht committees, and for the past year, uh, 20 years, he's given the Yom Kippur sermon here at Temple Shalom. His lectures are always dynamic and thought-provoking as he tries to help his audience with an impossible task to search for some understanding about this tragic event in Jewish history. Whether talking to his students at UBC or to members of the Jewish community in Vancouver, or really anyone who's been taught by my father, it's clear that he is revered. Having a father that is so widely respected is actually a gift to his children. Kurt gave that gift to my dad, and my dad has given that gift to us. I feel pride when I even say his name, knowing that will, it'll elicit some genuine knee-jerk response of respect and admiration. Just like my dad was influenced by his father, I too was influenced by my father, more than he probably understands. After high school, I ended up pursuing a degree in history with a focus on 20th century history. And shortly after I graduated, I also worked at the Vancouver Holocaust Education Center for two years. I even gave one lecture at one of the high school uh, symposiums. Although I didn't realize it at the time, looking back now, I know what I was trying to do. Recreate the inspiring path that my dad had forged. At a certain point, I realized these shoes were pretty big to fill. So I ended up pursuing a different path. But dad, I want you to know that you are unequivocally my first and best teacher. Hi, everybody. Um, great to see you guys here. Uh, I'm very honored to be here. Um, you know, we have so many important memories in this building, our family. Uh, my earliest memory is from 1988 at Ellen's Bat Mitzvah. I had come a little late. Uh, as a cranky three-year-old, it was thought that it might be a little tough for me to make it through a whole service. Uh, so some of our friendly neighbors brought me a little bit towards the end. Uh, first thing I did, obviously, Dad, I don't know if you remember this, was run right up onto the bima and sit on Mom's lap, uh, right in the middle of Ellen's sermon. So, sorry, El, sorry about that. Um, Mom loved coming to shul, uh, especially during the high holidays. It was a really meaningful time for her. Um, though we were always a little fashionably late, probably a little, a little later than she would have liked um, on most occasions. She felt particularly connected to saying the blessings over the candles on Shabbat evenings, 
with the uh, A.W. Binder version of the tune, which I believe she did at each of our B'nai Mitzvot. Uh, Dad, I know you really enjoyed that too. Um, it's hard to believe that we're approaching the 10 year anniversary, uh, this July actually, of when we said uh, goodbye to mom for the last time right here. Um, I've mentioned before that it's, it's amazing how much has happened since then and that I wish we could share these things with her and I think this event would be right near the top of the list. Um, I don't remember exactly how old I was when I started learning about the Holocaust or the profound effects it had on our family and ancestors, but it was very early on. Um, without mom's encyclopedic and passionate knowledge of history, there's so much that I or we wouldn't have been aware of. Um, one story that mom told me at quite a young age, always made a big impact, was it had to do with our grandfather Hans, her father, who died in the 1960s. Uh, he had been arrested by the Gestapo in 1936. And before they took him to the station, he had managed to grab his army uniform from his time as a soldier in World War I in Germany. Um, and because of this quick thinking, he was able to use that to actually escape the station and make his way into Czechoslovakia. Uh, eventually, he emigrated to New York City, where mom was born. Uh, where she met dad. Uh, it's a story that has so much importance to me and I'm really proud to tell it to people as well. Um, dad, <clears throat> mom had so much respect for you as a husband, as a father, as a historian and an, an educator. Uh, she would have been so touched um, by your dedication to continuing to trace the final steps of her grandparents before they were sent to their deaths during the Holocaust, uh, a project which she had planned to pursue in retirement, but she never got to do. And even though you're stepping down from this distinguished role, I'm so proud of the legacy you created with it and that you'll continue to provide critical Holocaust education. I also know that mom would have been so appreciative that it carries her name as the Rhoda Friedrichs Memorial Lecture. Thanks, Dad. So there is dessert coming around. We have a little bit more to discuss, so please don't hesitate to dig into the dessert. Uh, we just have a few more remarks to share. Okay. Um, my role up here is to introduce the book, but I want to say one other thing before that. There is there's a midrash, there's a story, a, a folk tale in Jewish tradition about a certain man a Jew who is wandering in the desert, he is lost, he is hungry, he is thirsty, he is, he is schwitzing in the heat, unable and unsure if he's going to survive the journey that he's on, and he happens upon a tree. And he lays beneath the tree, and it has running by it a cool stream, and it has sweet and nourishing fruit from its limbs and shade from its branches. And he lays down and rests and takes a nap and wakes up refreshed. And he turns to the tree and he says, O tree, O tree, how should I bless you? I would bless you with fruit from your, from your limbs, but you already have fruit. I would bless you with shade from your branches, but you already have shade. I would bless you with a cool stream that runs by your roots, but there is already a cool stream. O tree, O tree, how should I bless you, he says. I bless you that all of your offspring should be just like you. Chris, to sit here and to listen to your children and Rhoda's children to see and to know as they have shared with us that long before you were our teacher, you were their teacher. And to see how blessed you are by your three children and how blessed they are by you and Rhoda. 
Well, that is truly all and more than we could possibly hope for. And so I want to just thank you, Jonathan and, and Jeremy and Ellen, for what you shared with us about your dad, because we really got to know him even more through your eyes and through your heart. Thank you. Thank you. My, uh, my mother, not so jokingly, reminds me a few times a year, Danny, which is what she calls me, actually she now calls me Rabbi Dan in all of her notes, but anyhow, um, you really need to write a book. You need to write a book. And if those that recall, I tried once and she ended up in the ICU during my sabbatical and nothing ever came of the book. But Chris gave me the opportunity to actually write a book, though not of my own content. <laughs> But it's been a pleasure to serve as sort of the designer and layout person for the book that we are about to share with you this evening. The greatest gift was that I got to read 20 years of your drashot, of your lectures, 10 or so of which I was not here for. One of the incredible things and the important things about a book, and you know this and your children know this as historians, and Rhoda knew this as well, is that Things that live on the internet, they say, and we tell our children they'll live forever, but we know that as soon as those bits and bytes disappear, so will those stories and so will that insight. It's hard to find things that you've found in an email or that you've downloaded from a website and put into a folder, but books, as our people know, as the people of the book, live forever. And so the great gift of tonight is that your 20 years of scholarship and teaching and learning will live forever. And they'll do so in this anthology that I hold before you now and that all of you will receive a copy of. The title is Reflections on the Shoah, Chris Friedrichs, and the cover image is of the sculpture, the Holocaust Memorial sculpture that is in our Shalom Garden uh, in the back. And there is a description about that. I want to acknowledge Marielle Solan, who is over there at the Tech Tech. She took the cover photo. Um, it has been a true, not only labor of love, but it has been an incredible gift to me to be able to work with you, Chris, in designing this book and in producing it for not only our congregation and not just Vancouver, but hopefully for all of the Jewish world. And so after our dinner this evening and or after the service, whichever is convenient for you, we uh, invite you to come and collect your copies, but right now to bring up the author of this book, Chris Friedrichs. I think, I think you all know that I will be giving a drosh during the service that will begin at 8. And after hearing the things that have been said, and most especially by my own three children, I'm just glad that I have a little time between now and then to recover from the, um, the things that have been said. Because uh, I very much appreciate what um, Richard had to say and remind you that he is the person that caused this book to happen. I moved beyond measure by what my children said about me and especially also about, about my wife Rhoda. And I appreciate what Rabbi Dan said, both about, I never think of my children as being like me, but I appreciate what you said and I, I am very, proud to have children who in their different careers are as gifted as they are and way beyond that who as human beings are something that I would just wish everyone who has children could feel about their children and I think most people do the way I do about my three. And um, I'm delighted to think that I, uh, people in this room will walk out of here with this book which was a project that involved a fair number of people, and here at Shul, especially Rabbi Dan. And um, I will have more to say about all this when the service, at the point in the service, when I think I will have recovered my equanimity and <laughs> be able to say more. But I'm thrilled to see so many people here, and I am uh, looking forward to expressing the thoughts that I have a little more fully in an the right moment during our service.
So as we wrap up this portion of our evening, I just want to thank our committee that helped pull this evening together. Um, and I'm doing this without a list, which is something that they tell you never to do. So if I miss somebody, I, I definitely apologize in advance. But as I look around the room, uh, Michael Jacobson and Marie Henry and John Silver and um, Jerry Grow and, and my Michael and who else am I missing? And Shirley, and Shirley Cohn. There's Shirley. Uh, and to Kathy Lowenstein in our office, uh, who helped along with Marielle and our entire staff. Uh, you know, we do a lot of things at the synagogue, and dinners is part of that, but it, it's an all hands on deck uh, kind of thing. And so to make this evening work, uh, it really took the whole team. Uh, and so I want to acknowledge them and thank them for that. Uh, we invite you, uh, every uh, couple I think got a, um, or partnership or pair or whatever it was, uh, got a book with your dinner reservation, so we have a sign-up sheet here or a check-off sheet. We invite you to come up to the table now if you would like to, to get your book, or you can do it after the service as well. Um, we're not going to be signing the books, or uh, Chris isn't going to be signing the books this evening because it's Shabbat, but that's just another reason to connect with Chris in another time because he would very much appreciate the opportunity to sign the books for you. Thank you all so much. Shabbat Shalom. Services will begin in about 10 minutes. Shabbat Shalom.